Hello and welcome to a video a little bit different to pretty much everything else on the channel. It's about time, I think, that I told you about my dog, Basil. Uh, he's appeared in a few videos over the years. Here he comes. Ambush! <laughs> oh, you hate me so much! What have you done? Okay, so if we don't mind, I'm just gonna lift you up. I'm just lifting you up, man. Right, you're going back on. I know, I know. Don't kill us. <laughs> Welcome to the Halloween special. I should have you on more video, shouldn't I? And uh, <laughs> he was a character. I had Basil for 16 years when yesterday, on the 1st of March, 2021, uh, he was put down. But the stories he left behind, I think I want to share with you guys because he's he's been in videos. I always see comments asking how Basil is and I, I wanted to make a video that just kind of put it all out there. Maybe you didn't know who Basil was, but by the end of this video, I'm hoping to give you a, a more fuller picture of what kind of dog Basil was. And seeing as I'm a YouTuber, we're gonna make a video on it, obviously. <laughs> I guess we need to start even before Basil was born. Uh, when I was a kid, my grandparents had a beagle called Ben. Memory I have of Ben was that I would, I would always lie on the floor when I was a little toddler and I would put my legs out in like a V shape because I'd just be lying on the floor and Ben would always come in and he would just sit in between my legs. I don't know, so nice about it that he was just like, oh, he was just there. Um, and Ben didn't live too much longer uh, after I well, really cognitively knew who he was. But because of Ben, I wanted a beagle, I think. That, that was the main reason, because of Ben. Ben was the reason that Basil was brought into existence. <laughs> Uh, and in 2004, when I was 12 years old, in a little place in Northumberland up north called Twizzle, where Basil, known as the Antichrist, was born. <laughs> I'd badgered my parents like so much to get a dog to the point where I either wanted a dog or I wanted a sturgeon, which is a type of bony fish that can grow up to like 12 foot long. <laughs> and I, I drew up plans to like dig up my parents' garden <laughs> so I could put a pool, like a pond in. Um, and I was, I was so determined it was going to be one or the other. And whether my parents Regret it or not, I'm sure they don't regret it. At points in their life, I'm sure they did. We uh, we went all the way up to Twizzle. So the three boys, uh, there was one that had like a big white stripe down his face, uh, one that had a little thin stripe down his face, and one that was just like solid black. Um, and by the time that we decided which one we wanted, uh, which was the one with the big white stripe that ran down its face, it was already taken. So we were left with two. One of them would end up being Basil. The breeders really wanted us to take the, uh, the strong colored one, the black one, because as it would get older, the, the colors would be stronger in it. And you know, with a, with a beagle, it's got a lighter colors, it would fade. And, and we went up again. And we got to, we went in the house and they got to play around on the floor. There was something, I think, about, uh, not the one with the strong colors, the one with this little thin stripe on its, on its head. And this one ended up being Basil. Are you going to be in Yeah. Yes. yes. Ah, what? Yeah, Basil. What? Basil. Basil. Uh, he was never fussed about playing with his brother, but he would hold his own. It was almost like, get off. <laughs> so we ended up taking Basil home, I think that day. I'm really not too sure. And and that's when it started. Well, you know, I'd said to my parents, oh, yeah, I'll walk him. I'll, I'll take, I'll look after him and everything. I'll sleep in my room, you know. I assume my parents knew that that was probably not going to be the case. <laughs> they'd already, they'd already planned to, to take care of this dog and to walk it all the time. First evening, I should say, I, I just vividly remember it. We were sat at the table eating and we'd had a crate and everything, you know, to do crate training for him. And he was, he was in the kitchen and we were in the dining room and we're eating dinner and he, we put him in his crate because we're like, okay, we're going to be eating. He'll, he'll be a, what, separate, you know? And he's, he's just started barking, 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 barking. And I remember thinking to myself, oh no, <laughs> oh no, what have I got myself into? It's never going to be the same again. I remember those words going through my head. Uh, and later that night, bunk bed and I would sleep on the bottom bunk 
uh, just to comfort him, be with him. But, you know, after, after a couple of minutes, or 10, 20 minutes, whatever, he would get up and he wouldn't be settled and he would, you know, whinge and whine. You know, he's a puppy, he's away from home. But I was a kid and you know, I didn't really, I was like, oh, I'll go to bed, man. <laughs> so he wasn't settling in my room and we moved him into, into the bathroom and he was just not settling. He was barking, barking. And we were told that what we should do is just let him bark because then he'll realize that, oh, if he barks, nothing's going to happen. So he'll stop doing it. However, we were living in a hatched house. So we couldn't just let him bark because then the neighbors wouldn't get any sleep. So I just remember opening my door and seeing my mum walk across. She was in a dressing gown. She had a rolled up newspaper in her hand. Not to hit him, but just to whack the crate and be like, shut up. <laughs> but Basil was so, he couldn't understand that we wouldn't understand him. And when mum was telling the shoulder, he was like, no, I want to be out. So he just whack the crate and he'd start barking louder. The cycle repeated for maybe an hour or two hours. Uh, and then eventually we, we moved him into the conservatory. Now, whether it was, he, he realized that, oh, if I keep barking, I'm gonna be put further and further away. Or maybe he liked kind of being a little bit outside or, or we didn't hear him. Uh, that was where he would sleep for uh, the, the foreseeable future was just, he would go to bed in his, in his crate in the conservatory. Beagles stink. Oh my God, they stink. Throughout his entire life, he would go through different phases of stinking and smelliness. There's your outrageous over there. Oh, yeah, you're going to need a shower room. He's found some poop on the floor. Come here. Come here, look. Sit. Look there. See what he's rolled in there. Ew. But his most pungent was when he was a puppy. It was horrible. Like, he quickly realized that anything that was new would not stay new for long. Anything that wasn't chewed wouldn't be chewed for long. He would chew tables, chairs. Uh, we were told at one point because we had this big wooden teak chair, like a, uh, a beach chair sort of. Um, and he would chew the, the one of the, the bits of wood that was sticking out of it. And we were told, oh, what we should do is put vinegar on on the uh on the chair but that just made him like it even more he's like oh vinegar <laughs> one thing that was a blessing and a curse in a way was that he was incredibly food motivated so we would take him to puppy classes with little bits of cheese or hot dog and a clicker and everything we, we tried to socialize him with other dogs we got him to you know know all the dogs but he was always focused on that hot dog or, 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 or the bit of cheese and he would do all the tricks. He was incredibly intelligent. He'd pour, bar, well, we'd never taught him to speak. We didn't need to teach him to speak. <laughs> he was a good dog like that. He, he learned everything quick. And um, he was a stubborn bugger though. In the shower when he was getting washed, uh, there's just something about being in there. He was like, oh, I guess I'm just here. I've got to wait. <laughs> and that kind of, uh, from his first shower uh, to baths when he was, you know, a lot older, just sort of stayed with him. He would just be in there and be like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And then after, you know, after he would have his mad half hour, he would expect to get a treat and stuff. He'd bark at everything <laughs> until he got a little bit of food. I think what Winnie said about Basil was that Basil wasn't the kind of dog that when you first meet him, he would run up to you and he would he would be happy to see you if you were a stranger. Um, in fact, there was a lot of people on walks and stuff who would see him and see how cute he was and be like, oh, he's a good boy, we're gonna stroke him. And then as soon as you go near him, be like, whoa, who are you? <laughs> I don't know you. So earning, earning Basil's love, um, it wasn't easy. Uh, he was very picky. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, he would give it freely. He was as happy-go-lucky dog that would, um, you know, love everybody he met. You had a tennis ball through it. He would, you know, but even food sometimes. Uh, if you gave him food, he'd take the food, but he still wouldn't like you. He'd be like, oh, I like the food, but I'm not, well, I don't know who you are. <laughs> I, I could tell you stories. I could tell you so many stories, but I'll, I'll spare you uh, a lot of them and tell you a few a few good ones uh, one time when we went off to the beach um, we would want to take him off the lead but every time we did something would happen something would go wrong and it got to the point where every time I, we would go to the beach i'd be like no please don't take him off the lead don't do it uh one time we did and there were some rocks kind of submerged but not really like the waves were breaking on these rocks they were very slippy and for whatever reason he just decided to get in his head he's just gonna go onto those rocks to the very edge, and he just bolted. He was far away from us, and there were seagulls. You could hear him in the distance, like a He wouldn't come back. Uh, that's the thing. Like he would only come back when he would want to. He would, he would often check in. He would come back to him and be like, "I'm back. Can you give us something to eat?" And then he'd go off again because <laughs> he knew, like you know, if we wanted him back, we'd call him, and he'd come back, and he would expect 
uh, something in return. We had to go oh, hey, get onto these rocks and just try and catch him. Another time he found a dead seal. Massive seal. I don't know where this thing came from. Um, and it wasn't until like he wasn't leaving this thing alone. We got closer. We found himself rubbing himself on it. Another time he ate a dead fish. Swallowed that all the way down. Uh, he waited until we got home and then threw it up in the conservatory, this rotten fish. <laughs> when he was, you know, about four or five years old, that for whatever reason, he decided to eat crap on his walks. We would end up walking and you'd have to look a meter in front of you. Every walk was stressful because you didn't want him to eat crap, but you knew if you weren't vigilant, he'd get it. So you'd have to look like a me two meters, three, whatever it was in front of you to make sure the path was clear. He had a very powerful nose. He'd be able to sniff it out where wherever it was. You'd think he'd be sniffing for like, oh, he's going to pee on a tree or something, but sniffing and then you're like, oh, God, there we go. <laughs> it's almost like it's psyched you out. Like he knew you'd be waiting. Oh, yeah, I'm going to pee here. Not really. Led up to us having to put a muzzle on him. My mum would walk him and you could tell that people would see Basil and he would have his muzzle on. Oh, they'd think vicious dog. And my mum would be like, oh, he's not vicious. Don't worry. He just eats crap. <laughs> it didn't really make too much of a difference. We we ended up not putting the muzzle on him too much because it, it was just spoiling his walks. You could tell he wasn't very happy. He didn't want it on. And in some case, it wouldn't even stop him. He would just have crap caked around his muzzle. <laughs> <laughs> he would show affection in a, in, a, in a few different ways. One of them being that he would put his back against you. So if you were sat on a, on a sofa or a chair, he would turn his back. He would walk in, he would turn his back and he would just sit next to you. And he would just put his back next to you. That was his way of showing affection. It wasn't much. He wasn't an overtly open uh, kind of affectionate dog. That was his way. That was his way of saying that he trusted you and he liked you. No matter who knew Basil, university friends, school friends, they would always ask how Basil was, expecting some horror story. One of the craziest escapades, and I think uh, this could be called Basil's Great Adventure. One time when I was in high school, I had some friends over at lunch. I went to my place. I don't know what we did there, but I'd let Basil out of his crate. I think I just kind of left him in the house. I'd went back to school. Yes, I'd locked the door and everything. However, our garage door, which is fixed long, long ago, uh, you could just push open from the inside. But once I'd left, at some point, Basil had managed to scratch open the door into the garage, got into the garage, and pushed open the door uh, onto the street. So he he ran down the street, ran to the local co-op. He was running up and down the aisles in this store, pulling off loaves of bread in like a manic panic because he knew he was like... He didn't know where he was, but he knew he wanted food. So he was just going around, grabbing anything he could. <laughs> school kids, these kids from my school who were on their break or whatever, coaxing him with chips from the chippy. They they said they tried to like catch him, but he was just, he was not, he didn't want to be caught. He was running away from everybody. For whatever reason, something clicked in him. And he just knew where he was and he bolted back up. You know, there was two roads in front of this co-op. Uh, that he could have been ran over. Each time when he ran there and when he and never he just knew where he was, ran back across the roads, up the street, and into the house again. <laughs> like, he was like, wait, I know where I am. I'll, I'll go home. <laughs> just off he went. Just bolted all the way back home. And again, one thing we found out very early on is not only did Basil stink, but he was loud. Oh, 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 oh. He had the sound for when he wanted you to scratch him more. Even just lying down. He made everything into this comical uh, cacophony of sounds. I don't think anybody except for me ever heard him howl because you think he was a hound he would he could often howl you you'd go up to him go Ooh, and he would do it <coughs> no and I just woke up to this this sound <coughs> While recording that at some point, he, he actually heard me like make noise. So he just completely stopped and his little head would poke out and be like, oh, you're here. <laughs> and even though he was bought 
for me wanting a dog i think he became my mum's dog my, my mum uh would take care of him and do whatever for him you know if he'd woken up and he'd been sick or if he'd pooped in the concerto or you know whatever she didn't really complain uh i mean she would have of course but she'd, she'd clean it up <laughs> yeah my mum would hate that of course i complain i didn't want to do it <laughs> she tried her best to make that house smell like normal uh, i remember i would have a german tutor when i was in high school before she would come over we would just get the febreze out and just desperately spray the <laughs> the room so it didn't stink like dog and every time she would come over she'd be like oh, that smells really nice in here basil was a smart dog um to the point where he would push out chairs jump on the chair and then jump on the table um we would if, if ever like let's say there was a normal table you know all the food was there people were sat there eating if one person got up to go to the toilet or go you know get some more food from somewhere else you would know for a fact basil would jump up in two seconds you know you'd, you'd see that on his, he would just kind of like pour to get whatever was within arm's reach and flip it onto the floor our counters unfortunately our kitchen counters were just at the right height that basil could jump up and sort of reach on there was plenty of times where things were just you know forgotten accidentally left just too close to the edge you normally you would just have to push everything back from the counter to the wall so he wouldn't be able to reach it and he'd wait until you were gone until he thought he would be in with a chance that he could get it and eat it without you knowing and you could see he would like move over different ways and try and uh try and get stuff he wouldn't bark or anything because he knew if he barked you'd come back so he'd deliberately be sneaky and not tell you about it he would hide under tables if there were, you know if people were eating you'd hide under the table and bark and then if ever you would grab him you know to to tell him off or to pull him get him out from under the table or oh, he did the best exorcist impression it was brilliant as soon as you grab his collar it would... <laughs> he would scream bloody murder it would sound like you were killing him which you were you were just trying to like get him away from the table or whatever he really was a nightmare nightmare the nicest moments with basil either if you were on a walk with him or you know he he was tired those were the nicest times when he wasn't you know barking at you for food or go outside eating crap when he was just relaxed and he had his pack and when he was about seven seven or eight years old i met whitney and whitney loved him whitney always wanted a dog uh she grew up with dogs she was she was younger when she had dogs uh, so she never had a dog when you know she could actually take care of a dog and look after one basil loved her they loved each other really there was there was a relationship that those two had that was similar to the relationship uh basil had with my mum, which was trust uh, basil wasn't loyal really i can't say he was loyal because if anybody had food he'd be gone he would do this thing where he would sit next to you all of a sudden he would just throw himself back and he would just be like on his back as if he was like sitting and he would just be putting his weight against you. And he would very rarely do that with me, but he would do it all the time with Whitney. Mine, his relationship was an odd one. Who's your good boy? Who's your good boy? I think he, he always saw me as this little brother that needed to be kept in check. You know, whenever he'd be like, oh, you were, are you going to do anything stupid today? Hey, growl at me. <laughs> Can I trust you today? I knew in his 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 own way, the same way I, I, I had for him that uh, we, we loved each other. He led a good life. He went on a lot of walks. Anywhere where we could take him, we would take him. He had beds all around the house for a long time. He, ne he didn't sleep in a crate. Um, he would he would just put himself to bed. You'd put the blanket over him. Bed. Well, you'd say that. If you were up after you put him to bed and he heard you, would you believe he'd bark? Of course he'd bark. He'd, he'd bark at anything. Uh, unfortunately, he did get an ear infection and he went completely deaf. Uh, it didn't really affect him a great deal. We, he, he could he could definitely feel vibrations, you know, if you stamped your feet or if you, you made a noise that was loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> but his his insatiable appetite was probably his downfall in a lot of ways and you know we were as vigilant as we could be but we're talking about basil here if there was a way to get something you couldn't leave anything for a second and he would get it it got to the point we had a bin that was like a foot pedal bin that would open when you, you got it he would just tip them over so it got to the point where we had to install a lock onto the bin like a clip 
so that even if the bin was pushed over, he wouldn't get it. There was one time my mum remembers that she was uh, cooking. She had like the, a big potato somehow fell on the floor. Basil, of course, because if you were in the kitchen, he would follow you and he'd be with you the whole time. Because if you dropped something, bam, he'd be there. He got it. He got this whole potato in his mouth. A big potato. It wasn't just like a little new potato. It was a big one. And he ran off into the garden when we was trying to chase him. And he was like, <laughs> just trying to eat this potato as quickly as possible. Was one thing I'll always remember was him just running away with food and trying to eat it on the go so you couldn't get it off him. But uh, as he got older, he, um, he slowed down. Uh, a lot. He wouldn't bark at the table anymore, which was so good. I remember, you know, maybe two or three years ago uh, eating, I said, you know, we, we couldn't do this. For so many years, we couldn't do this without having just a constant barking from another room because we had to take Basil out and put him in, the, in, the, in a different room. And it was nice. He, he just went to his bed and he would just sit there. It was almost like a thank you in a way that, you, you know, you'd put up with him for so long that, you know, he's like, you know what? You deserve a break. I'll not bark anymore. But it was on his term. It wasn't that anything we did couldn't be bothered anymore. <laughs> and Whitney always loved to fuss over him. She she bought this banana costume, this banana split costume. And you know what? He was completely fine with it. He didn't care. <laughs> he just went out on one Halloween or maybe two Halloweens in a row. He would, he would wear that, uh, that banana costume and give everybody a laugh. Who, who saw him in it? But he he honestly didn't he didn't try to get it off or anything. I don't know what it was. Uh, maybe maybe it was because Whitney put it on him. He just put up with it. You know, he was a dog that barked, and whenever it came to food, oh, he couldn't he couldn't handle it. He was a very well natured dog. He was he never attacked any other dog. He never bit any anyone. But one thing that he did in his life in his 16 years, he met a lot of family dogs when he was on the scene. Uh, there was only one other dog in the family. At the time of his death, there was five, six new dogs. There would always come a point where they would meet Basil. And up until that point, the puppies, because they were they were normally puppies, had never barked, never barked. But they loved Basil. Basil never liked dogs, or he was never fussed. When these puppies, these family dogs, it was almost like a ritual. You know, they would come to see him. And it didn't matter what dog it was, there would come a point when it would find Basil really interesting. Maybe it was the infection in his ears that smelled nice, but they would always go for his face. They would, they would really like getting into his face. And Basil would just couldn't be bothered. He was like, ah, I get up. And he would bark at them. And he would bark. And he would just sit there and bark at them. Like, go away. Leave me alone. Stop it. And at some point, they would bark back. I don't know what it was about him. But he would he would give them their voice. You know, these, these dogs that were completely silent. He gave Roo, uh, the Chihuahua, who you've seen in the... Uh, Roo Wawa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he gave him his voice. It was like if he could pass something on and it was something that Basil was known for, it was his barking. For a year or two years, Basil had started to slow down. You know, do dogs do this. People do this. He would still go out for his walks, but a lot slower. He had a little bit of arthritis. He, uh, he went blind in one eye, so he was deaf. He was blind in one eye, but he could still smell. And that's, that, that was the main thing that defined him was his smelling. He'd stopped eating poo, or I don't think he'd stopped eating poo. He just couldn't see it anymore. So walks became a lot nicer. Uh, he would be like, it's here. You'd sniff it, be like, it's here somewhere. I don't know where it is. And you'd pull him. So I think in the end, he just kind of stopped. Um, you'd eat anything. That's the thing. It, it didn't matter what it was. He loved to eat. And I always said that when he stops eating, that's, that's when you know that, it's coming to an end, you know. I, I remember I made a, a video when I was younger um, called Be Beagles Don't Chew. And it was him coming uh, back home from a walk. You'd hear him like race in the house. Like you'd hear he the, you know, there's nails clacking on the wooden floor just because he couldn't move as fast as he wanted to get to the back into the kitchen to eat that. And it, nothing was left. It was either vet or Caesar Milan that we'd seen or whatever. Um, you know, the reason why dogs eat so much and so quick uh, is because they they don't know when the next meal's coming. Because in the wild, you know, they just, they just eat as much as they can right there and then. We were told, you know, when he'd eat his bowl to fill it back up again. 
and then he'd get the, the message that, you know, oh, well, doesn't matter how much I eat, there's always going to be food there. So he filled his bowl up once, he ate it all. We filled his bowl up a second time. He ate that all. And he started to look like he was going to explode. And we filled up a little bit for the third time. And he was still scoffing it down. We're not going to do this because he's going to kill himself. <laughs> Every time he would eat, he'd eat it so quick that he wouldn't even breathe. You could hear him <laughs> like inhaling it. It would obviously get stuck in his throat or something because it was mixer. And we'd often like water it down and stuff. But he'd eat it so quickly that he would just throw up. It would be like, oh, 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 oh. Oh, I'll eat that as well. <laughs> it's just like, it was horrible. Winnie would always say that he was a good boy. And nobody would agree with that. Not even my mum, who would take care of him all the time. He was never a good boy. He was a well-natured dog. But when you would see Basil, you would know that there was more going on with him. He wasn't a dog that was, he wanted to please you. You know, he was, oh, I'll bring that back for the owner. Oh, yeah, they'll like that. I'll be a good boy. He would look at you and you could tell there was something going on in that head. There was a thought, a thought process behind everything. Whitney told me that one time, uh, in a lot of time, he would just sit next to Whitney and she, uh, she would ask him for poor and he would look at her and be like, you don't have any food. <laughs> you could tell he was like, you don't have anything. He, he would sometimes give it to her. It was almost like a pity thing. He'd be like, Ah, oh, there you go then. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> like, you would never do it enthusiastically. You'd just be like, oh, okay. <laughs> I feel sorry for you. I'll keep you. You knew exactly what you meant. He could be very gentle. You know, if you had a cut or a wound or something, you know, he, he would sniff it. And Not that I would ever say if you've got a cut or a wound, go to a dog. Because especially Basil, whose mouth was filled with crap most of the time. Uh, <laughs> so he would not clean it. He'd probably get it infected. And we, we looked into it. We looked like, why is he eating poop? This isn't normal. Like, and of course, that search would come up. Oh, you know, mothers eat their dog's poop to try and, you know, get them clean and stop their smells and stuff. Basil just ate it because it was something. That was it. He just loved eating so much that, oh, well, it's, it's practically waste here. People go around picking up poops. You just have to get Basil. Just let him go in your street and clear it up. You should pay for this. <laughs> and about a few days ago, um, he completely stopped eating. Um, we didn't know why this was. Just He just stopped eating. And that, that was when uh, something was up. Um, my mum took him to the vets, um, checked his heart. His heart was strong. That's what the, the vet would always say. You know, sometimes you'd see dog owners come in and the, the, the dog would be on the last legs. But the owner would be like, no, he's going he's gonna to live till he's 20 odd, you know. And the vet would be like, yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't say it, but he would know the dog wouldn't have long. He would say that every time he'd see Basil, he, he was strong. The reason why he was probably not eating was because he had an infection. So he jabbed him with three injections and off Basil went. But he, 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 he stopped eating for about two or three days still. The main reason that he went back to the vets was that he'd stopped drinking. Basil was never, it was some weird, he would, he would lose his balance when he would look at the water. And I don't know what it was about it. Uh, in his old age, he would like sway or his back legs would go, you know. Um, and we had like tiled floors in in the in the kitchen. He he just wouldn't be able to keep his balance. Like if he was on age go, oh, and he would just go <laughs> until he would hit a wall or somebody would somebody would help him. When he stopped drinking, um, that that was that was bad. And on on the morning of the first of March, twenty twenty one, I was I was woken up by Whitney. Um, and she was just in a state. Probably wouldn't want me to tell you that. Uh, <laughs> she was crying. She was upset. And as soon as I saw her, there was only one reason that Winnie would get this upset. And that it was something to do with Basil. And I knew that if she was that upset, that Basil was either gone or he was about, about there. And she told me that my mum had taken him to the vet's. Uh, that morning, um, the vet had smelt his breath and he said that he was sorry that he'd missed it the first time. But there's a distinct uh, smell on his breath that indicates kidney failure. And there's nothing, there's nothing that you can do. My mum said that the vet was ready to do it then, then and there in the morning. But, you know, because of, because of lockdown, um, we hadn't seen Basil in a while. We we went over and we we spent the whole day with Basil, 
we tried our best, you know, to get him to drink water, putting water next to his mouth. And even when he was panting at one time, I put water in his mouth, on his tongue. But there wasn't even like a, a slurp or anything. There wasn't like a, a gulp or, you know, he brought his tongue back. I think he just, he knew he was, he was ready to go. He, and he knew it. He, he knew it was time. We stayed there in the front room with him. The jaw muscles that... You know, when I was a kid, I remember having a rope pull and I would be spinning around in the garden and him moving him up and down in the air as he clung on. Um, those those jaw muscles were gone. So my mum had booked him back in that same day. Uh, he had like his final walk <laughs> with his tail. I don't know what his tail was doing, but it was it was helicoptering and spinning. And But we, we, we spent the whole day. And in fact, at some point, it felt like a normal day. It, you know, we were just sat in the front room. I was doing something. My mum was doing something. You know, I was I was clipping Warhammer. My mum was on her phone or watching TV, and Whitney was <laughs> looking at a magazine or uh, whatever. And he was just there in his basket sleeping, and it just felt normal. It didn't feel like in a couple of hours he was gonna be gone. And eventually, the time came. Um, 16 years ago, I was the one that brought him into that house. <laughs> Little puppy. He was only like that big. He had like a big, a big Buddha belly on him. I was sat with my back against the sofa <laughs> and, um, I put him in between my legs and he was just, just sat there. This big pause. He was a little dog, but he had these big paws. He was just such a big fatty. So I, I brought him into that house 16 years ago when everyone was out outside the house and getting into the car, getting ready to take him to the vets. I said my goodbyes to him. He was just flopped out in his bed. It's so <laughs> his head was hanging out of it. I don't know how much he could he could see or definitely couldn't hear. But the the eye that could see was the one that was sticking up. And I, I leaned over him and I said, thank you. He said, you don't deserve it. And I picked him up in, in his bed. I took him out that house. When I brought him in, he was small and full of energy. And when I took him out, he was old and spent. All that energy had been given. And we were told that only one person could go in with him. Quarantine and COVID and all that. I wanted it to be my mum. My mum was the one that had really taken care of him once I'd moved out. And even when I was there, when I, I lived with him, you know, the, as a kid, I'd say, you know, I'd take care of him and walk him, you know, brush his teeth, all this stuff. And, you know, a few weeks in, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't doing that anymore. But my mum did. My mum was always there. My dad helped out as well a lot. But it was my mum. My mum was the one that would clear up any mess. Any diarrhea in the conservatory, she'd be there clearing it up. You know, probably almost throwing up herself, but she'd be there <laughs> clearing it up. And I, I remember just opening that boot. It was like time slowed down. That boot opened so slow. I just remember the license plate. And then it revealed him in his bed exactly the same as he was when, you know, I saw him at home and he was... Half hanging out the bed. Sorry, I'm I'm sorry if you know you thought this video was gonna be a good one. Hey, all the fun times. If you have a dog, it it always ends the same. Even after all this, you know, the full day of not drinking, a few days of not eating, his heart was still going strong. I said to my dad when I was crying, I said to him, you know, he doesn't deserve all this. He was a little shit. And I probably won't censor that because that's. That's one thing we would say to him all the time. Every time he would deliberately do things that were bad. Because he knew. He knew he was being bad. But he didn't care. He did not care. As long as he got food, he would do it. There was one time he um he was in the, the, ba the back of the conservatory and he, he was barking to go out. So my mum, knowing or had biscuits or whatever in the front room, went through to let him out. And as she went through, he went past her to get into the front room. He deliberately lured her away. So he could get the sandwich or the biscuit or whatever was in the front. I said to my dad, like, he doesn't deserve all these tears. He was a little shit. And my dad, also crying, said to me, but he was our little shit. Whitney would always say, 
<laughs> he was a good boy. <laughs> he was never a good boy. He was never a good boy. He deliberately chose. Deliberately made the choice. He would know it was wrong, but he would do it anyway. He wasn't a good boy. He was our boy. I always remember him on the beach. Looking back. Covered in salt water, ready to stink up the car with wet dog and salt. And he'd look back at you with his tongue out. Be like, are we going? If we're going forward? Where are we going? And that was it. That was Basil's story. I always felt like I would do something for him when he was gone. He was always such a character. He wasn't just this happy-go-lucky dog or he wasn't just a grumpy dog. He had so much more going on. So much more going on in that head. Often, like, sometimes we would just go in the conservatory and just sat on a chair. For no reason. <laughs> he was just sat there, looking at a computer. <laughs> what are you doing? It he could have been in the sun. That's why he did it. But he was always an independent dog. As long as he knew where you were and how to get to you, he'd do his own thing. I remember holding his head on, like, the, the last day. And there was a part of me that was like, oh, he's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go over and, you know, I'll, I'll keep clipping my warhammer out. I just knew inside of me that don't do that. Because this, you'll never get this back. And I thought I had a good littleness. I thought I wasn't going to cry. Like I said, he doesn't deserve any of these tears. And this has probably been a long video. But he lived a long, long time. He lived for 16 years. I could make this video five hours long and still not tell half the things that he got up to. I think some things I I just want to keep to myself. I think that's okay. YouTube isn't a place where you share your entire life, I don't think. Or you shouldn't. It's not healthy. You guys saw Basil pop in a video every now and again. And you only saw little bits of him. And I would always get questions. Where was he? How was he doing? I think you deserve to know. For, for those of you that really want to know what Basil was like and how he affected me and he was always there high school university relationships you know moving out parents he was always there this is the part of the video where I say if you've enjoyed the video leave a like <laughs> but it doesn't feel right it doesn't feel right this isn't a let's play video this isn't a dinosaur video this is Basil's video this is my video for him if anybody's ever had a dog or a pet I think they know that their dog is special. If I was to get another beagle tomorrow, that I definitely wouldn't. They wouldn't be Basil. It was just something special about him. I, I don't know when I'll um, be back to making regular content. I'm sure it'll be sooner than later. Um, I, maybe even tomorrow, I might, I might decide, you know what? I did it. I did a, a video for Basil. And that's what I needed to do. And it's out my system and I'll... Uh, I'll be back to normal content. For today anyway, I'm just going to spend the day editing this video and getting this up. Take it day by day, I think. I think that's the only the only way to do it. Just like Basil did. Living in the moment. So I'll see you guys later. Bye bye